Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Rina Tramkumar. Today, today, Nico and I got the chance to interview Dr. Yor Kohner, who is currently working with science and policy. Are you excited, Nico? Yes, I'm actually quite excited because uh, yeah, it's another um, episode uh, about concerning your career after the PhD. And this time it's actually not, it's like a mix of between industry and how should I say, a government organization, I would say. So I'm okay. not entirely sure what exactly it is, but I guess we'll hear more later. Definitely. So in this series that we're trying to identify people who are in alternative careers, I think this is one of the more unique alternative careers that we've uh, come across. What do you say? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think it's one career that is not that people know of usually. I think it's, uh, but it's very important still. And I mean, I mean, generally consulting uh, is a career option that I think more people know of. But then uh, doing that for the government, I think is not the typical, uh, yeah, yeah, career path. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's waste no time and let's get on with the interview then. Dr. Corner, welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, I think Nico is very excited to talk to you today, so I'll hand over the reins to him. Okay, yes. So um, just a quick introduction. So Dr. Jörg Körner is uh, working at Akatech, which is a, the National Academy of Science and Engineering. And he. Uh, so what exactly he is doing there, we'll hopefully be hearing today. And yeah, so with this, uh, welcome, uh, Jörg, for, um, in this podcast. And thank you for uh, yeah, agreeing to be part of this. So maybe as a first question, um, how did you get to Akatek? How did you know of them? Hello, thank you for, for inviting me to talk on the podcast. And yeah, I'm uh, happy to jump in. So uh, how did I get to know Akatek? Uh, to be uh, completely honest, I only found out about uh, Akatek and what they do when I was looking for jobs. Uh, so I was uh, planning on changing uh, careers a couple of uh, years after my PhD and wanted to work ideally at the intersection of uh, politics and science, because these are the two, two topics I personally care most about. And yeah, that's uh, how I found Akatech and uh, the, basically had uh, the job ad out for the job that I'm currently working in. And yeah, luckily I got the position. Ah, okay. So uh, you mentioned you were actually uh, working somewhere else before. So uh, what were the exact steps uh, before uh, or after your PhD, if I may ask? So after I finished my uh, PhD, I stayed on for a short postdoc at the MPI for neurobiology uh, to, to finish the paper. And um, then I was a bit at a loss of uh, what to do next and took some time off to, to figure out uh, what to do, during which I worked uh, briefly as a, a tour guide here in Munich. And uh, then my next step was in uh, consulting for uh, bio, uh, biopharma industry. And I did that for one and a half years. And yeah, then decided that in the end, maybe consulting is not the, the right career for me and that I would rather look at something not at the intersection necessarily of business and science, but rather at the intersection of, uh, of politics and science. And that's why I moved to Akatech. Okay, so that means basically if we just maybe you jump one step uh, further ahead, even uh, or no behind rather, I guess. So after your PhD, you were first of all you had no idea what you wanted to do, and then you just uh, finished to have a break, and then started f start fresh from new, basically. Well, no ideas, maybe the 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 wrong term. I had a couple of ideas, but I didn't really know what what I, I wanted to do. So uh, mm -hmm. at some point uh, during my PhD, I, I started to seriously look at like, okay, maybe I don't actually want to stay in academia. So 
what other options are out there. And already back then, um, I thought, okay, maybe for me, a natural fit would be working somewhere at the intersection of, of science and politics. But there, I, I mm -hmm. kind of struggled to find where I could actually do that. And also the then the few of the first applications that I sent out and towards that direction, they just they just failed. I also still entertained the uh, idea of maybe doing a postdoc. And I kept uh, telling, yeah, as soon as I find the right lab that I really would like to, uh, to work in, then I'm for sure going to apply. But then at some point I figured out that mm -hmm. now it's like... Uh, almost half a year after I finished my PhD and I still haven't sent out any applications for a uh, postdoc. So maybe that's actually, even though I kept telling myself it wasn't that high on the list. I was just thinking because you said back in that time, right? So like, I, can you just give us a brief time frame of when, when this was, like when you actually finished the PhD and when you started with the consultancy? Like, yeah, so I finished my PhD in January 2016, then mm -hmm. stayed on till the end of summer uh, as, a, as a postdoc. Then I worked in consulting from beginning of 2017 till September 2018. And in uh, September 20, uh, October 2018, I joined Akatech and I've been working there now for a bit more than one and a half years. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you for your honesty. I think this is not uh, easy to uh, to admit that uh, like that um, you weren't sure what to do uh, with your career, but you always knew that you wanted to go into this like a mixture between science and politics. Uh, why uh, why were you so interested in uh, this mixture? Um, I guess I already was super interested also in uh, in politics uh, since I, since I was in in high school. And for a long time, as kind of like extracurricular activity or hobby, I worked for a youth organization called the European Youth Parliament. That basically it organizes parliamentary simulations uh, to engage uh, young Europeans in, in topics of, of European politics. And I enjoyed that that very much. But uh, the other part of me always said, like, yeah, no. But the most interesting thing is actually figuring out how the brain works and if you want to do that then you need to be a scientist that's why like academically i i trained in science and did the politics part more as a as a hobby but then at some point i was like okay if you like those two things so much maybe there is a possibility to actually do a little bit of both okay so that means uh while your training was basically only in science you gathered these other experiences uh, or skills uh, in your free time as your hobby and then by now you kind of combine both in your uh, job that you have now is that is that uh, correct to say it like this yeah i mean that 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 sounds true that's definitely also the way i tried to sell it when i was uh, interviewing for the job um, but I mean, there's also quite uh, quite a couple of uh, skills from from your PhD that you can can apply in such a setting. I mean, definitely not the mm -hmm. content knowledge, but I mean, you learn mm -hmm. a, a lot of other things during your PhD. Okay, so which uh, skills exactly would you say are you using uh, nowadays that you learned in your PhD? I mean, one thing that definitely helps is that, that you're trained to, to think analytically and critically. Like sometimes, I mean, I don't work with a lot of data, but sometimes you also need to look at data or at least you need to, to uh, look at different lines of reasoning and you need to try to figure out which are the ones that make, actually make more sense or, or how things fit together. I mean, that's something that you definitely learn during your PhD. And something else that I think really helps is um speaking your mind even if you're in a room with people that clearly outrank you or you think that are smarter than you or definitely have more authority like for example if you go to uh to conferences and so on and then even if i mean if the big professor in science you still feel feel it's your right even as a phd student to ask critical question and i think that that helps then when when we are conducting interviews with experts that uh, yeah that I'm not afraid to ask critical questions. Okay, yeah, no, that's true. So for your uh, job right now, 
so what is actually what are you doing in your job right now maybe that's uh something we should uh try to answer before yeah maybe maybe i give first a little general background mm -hmm. and then go into what the more day-to-day -day, uh, yes. work looks mm -hmm. like so sounds good yeah i'm working uh for the innovation dialogue that's an advisory council for the gov uh, federal government um, so there's 17 experts from academia and businesses and mm -hmm. they meet uh, once every half year with representatives from the government. So with uh, the chancellor, the finance minister, the minister of uh, the economy and the minister of uh, education and research. And they discuss one current topic of uh, innovation or science mm -hmm. policy. And what we do at the office at uh, ACADEC for the Innovation Dialogue, we, is, we, we prepare these sessions and we write a, a policy paper that uh, this expert council then uses as the basis for that discussion. And for that, uh, the team that I'm working in basically conducts interviews. We uh, do desk research, so see what are already publications mm -hmm. that are relevant out, mm -hmm. out there. And the expert interviews is also we probably try to, for each topic, talk to the really most uh, relevant, outstanding people from mm -hmm. both the, the scientific field, but also from, uh, from businesses that you can, can find in Germany so that we can present mm -hmm. a very coherent, comprehensive picture on, uh, on the issue to the government. Okay. Um, so all of the experts need to be located in Germany, though. Right. Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, oh. mainly uh, we focus on uh, on German experts, but often we also branch out to other uh, European uh, countries, uh, especially if, for example, we want to draw some comparisons of how things are done in different mm -hmm. countries, then we, mm -hmm. we also reach out to other experts. But to somehow um, keep the number of people that we need to talk to manageable and to also ensure that what they say is especially relevant to the situation here in mm -hmm. Germany. The main uh, body of experts that we talk to usually are, are from Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that also means that, uh, I mean, if you have to, you have to read a lot of literature that is not outside of, uh, that is outside of your field, right? Um, so uh, if you have to put together these reports and also interview the people, um, how difficult is it to do that? Um, Yes, um, ab absolutely. It um, uh, uh, can be quite challenging. I mean, there's uh, usually the topic of, uh, that we discuss is not every time uh, mm -hmm. neurobiology. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not mm -hmm. what, I, uh, what I did during my, uh, my PhD. And depending on how uh, challenging the topics are, so we were discussing quantum technologies at one time. And then, of course, it, it's not the easiest field to get into, but then also the we don't need to become technical experts, right? We mm -hmm. our audience in the end, mainly the government, and there a lot of them will also be lay people on the topic, so they also are not experts. So mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we don't write too much of a technical paper. But at the on the other hand, of course, you need to have at least a basic level of understanding to also figure out what actually the the challenges and opportunities mm -hmm. are and also mm -hmm. to ask the, the, the interesting questions to the experts. Okay, so what kind of topics have you worked on uh, so far? So it can be technology field specific, mm -hmm. like for example I mentioned uh, quantum technologies, mm -hmm. or it can be more uh, cross-cutting topics. So we were talking about innovations for the Green Deal, Mm -hmm. uh, about what uh, the rise of China as an innovation nation mm -hmm. means for the German innovation system, about mm -hmm. circular economy. So mm -hmm. uh, the topics can be very broad or they can be uh, specific on, on one, uh, one type of technology. Okay. And how do you find these experts? So you just usually Google, okay, and then you find, okay, the, there's this topic and these professors or companies that um, are leading in their field and then you just contact them or do you already have a network of contacts uh, that you can work with? Uh, it's a little bit of both. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of course, there's this, this uh, body, the 17 experts that then meet with, uh, with the government mm -hmm. and they usually already know some interesting people to talk to. So okay. that's one mm -hmm. starting point. Then, since Akatech itself is uh, an academy of science, 
they usually are also in uh, in the members uh, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Akatech. There's often experts for for each of the topic. Oh, okay. And then what's yeah. uh, a bit special about Akatech compared to other academies of science is they have not only the academy part where there's uh, scientists, mm -hmm. but there's also the so-called senate in which the companies that are active in in uh, research and development in Germany. Mm -hmm. So not all of them, but most of the companies, mm -hmm. they are part of that Senate. So that's mm -hmm. also a part of our network. So we can reach out to those to whether either they are uh, experts themselves or they can refer, refer us to interesting people to talk to. But then, of course, also what we do is actually starting mm -hmm. to Google. Then you've, once you figure out, you find some literature on the topic. Mm -hmm. And if you see the mm -hmm. same names coming up again and again, then it oh, probably okay. is a is a good sign that that's an interesting person to, to talk to. Going back to the PhD life before you started your job at Akatech, uh, so when you sort of uh, decided to move outside of academia or think about jobs outside of academia, did you ever have any form of, were you discussing this with your peers or did you have any sort of peer pressure in terms of thinking, uh, why not give academia a, another shot? Or in that direction? I don't think I felt any peer pressure to stay within academia. I mean, especially, so, I mean, at the, the MPI of neurobiology, I mean, I knew quite a couple of uh, uh, PhD students that then afterwards moved out of academia. Mm -hmm. And I guess most of them would agree that they didn't feel that anyone was pressuring them to, to uh, stay in academia. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mm -hmm. there's also uh, the the PhD representatives at the time. They were uh, taking care of organizing courses, I guess, and uh, in coordination mm -hmm. also with the Impress office that uh, also included, for example, to how to look for or apply to jobs outside of mm -hmm. academia. Okay. So I think there there was no climate in at at the MPI that kind of said, "Lah, only in a career in academia is." Uh, is what we should pursue so i mm. didn't didn't feel okay. any any uh, negative feelings i guess mm. if you made the decision to say that you wanted to pursue postdoc maybe mm -hmm. uh, some of your peers or your pi would be a bit more enthusiastic in uh, helping you to to find that position but i mean that's that's yeah. understandable i i never felt mm -hmm. any negativity because i decided to move outside of, of okay Oh, that's okay. great because sometimes you hear that the PI kind of just loses interest in you because you don't want to stay in academia. At least that's what I've heard from some uh, people. No, um, no, I didn't feel that at all. I mean, also mean there was mm -hmm. still a paper to finish, so I guess also my PI was <laughs> quite interested in that. But I mean, yeah. in in general, I mean, I was uh, was quite lucky with my with my PI, and he was uh, quite supportive mm -hmm. of people in general. And I don't think anyone felt that they were kind of dropped just because they decided not to do a postdoc. It's actually good information to know that, you know, there is still support and there are a lot of support structures around the Institute to sort of guide you through the process, even if you want to leave academia and start a career in, in although like an academia adjacent, but still mm -hmm. it's not exactly doing research. So it's good to know that there is these support structures in different MPIs. I mean, would you say that you uh, took like uh, many courses uh, on how to go outside of academia or how to, uh, to prepare your, I don't know, prepare your CV differently, like the way you present yourself? I, I'm not, I would assume that it's somewhat different in academia compared to the industry. So did you have to like, I don't know, try many things? So I think I did two two courses at uh, uh, at the MPI, but mm -hmm. I also then attended quite uh, a lot of. I mean, there's the seminar series where mm -hmm. alumni or so come back oh, okay. um, and awesome. give talks about their careers later on. They usually mm -hmm. cover both careers in academia and outside mm -hmm. of academia. I was also part of a, a graduate school here in Munich, the uh, Graduate School of Systemic Neuroscience. They also had sometimes events and talks for what career options there are. And so I took, uh, took part in quite of them to, to also get a picture of what are the, the possibilities there. But for the like training or preparation uh, courses, I think I, I did two of them of how to, to apply. And yeah, then I guess uh, 
the, the first part is the how to you put your CV and so on, and I guess that you can practice with these courses. And then also the uh, how do you actually find what interests you and so on. I mean, there's also courses for that, but I also found that always a bit more personal and difficult, and that's always like what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. Exactly. And also these experiences from the different courses that one gets is very uniquely personalized depending on what each person is thinking about progressing with as well, right? So I definitely, like, I have this impression that if someone has career advancement courses or career development prospectuses at any institute, it's more associated towards improving a person's CV and the person's, the way they present themselves as a whole, regardless of whichever field they go to. Because I think there's a lot of, uh, cohesion between the two different or different fields in terms of the basic presentation skills of a person right no yeah i would uh, would absolutely agree to that i mean there's there's some things that are just common and uh, uh, you can can take out of it but then there's always also a still a, a, a specialized aspect okay now uh, so in your day-to-day -day, uh, work life what exactly is it that you usually do I don't think there's a, a typical uh, day. Uh, that, mm -hmm. That's also a good part of my job. It's quite, uh, it's quite variable. Um, the, it depends also always a bit on, on which phase of one of those cycles we're in. Because as I said, so every half a year there's a different topic. So basically mm -hmm. in the beginning of the cycle, it's a lot of desk research. So finding out, uh, finding the interesting texts to, uh, to read and then later side, uh, yeah, building up a kind of library of, of, uh, um, of information, finding out which experts to contact, reading up on the topic uh, just by ourselves, then starting mm -hmm. slowly to, to work out a structure for, for the policy paper that we want, uh, want to write. Then the second phase, it shifts more to uh, a lot of the interviews, and uh, at the same time, and then also writing. And, and that mm -hmm. is something that actually I found personally most challenging aspect of my uh, new job, uh, especially since I now need to write in, uh, in German. And I think like the mm -hmm. last longer texts that I've written have been uh, during my Abitur. Mm -hmm. So, because all my work environments I was uh, I was in before were always uh, English speaking only, and starting mm -hmm. from my my bachelor's thesis onwards, all the scientific texts I've written have always ever been in uh, in English. So, changing back to writing in German was a, a bit challenging. Also, yeah, I mean, you write your thesis, but apart from that, or you might write a paper, but mm -hmm. apart from that, writing isn't really uh, the main mm -hmm. part of of a PhD, at least not in the natural sciences. Yeah. Um, and then also when I was working as a consultant, uh, usually you make slides. So uh, nice, okay. beautiful yeah. PowerPoint presentations <laughs> with some uh, data and very little text on them. Mm -hmm. um, so also not really uh, a good training for <laughs> mm -hmm. writing. So yeah, that yes. was, was, was what quite changed a bit. So that's the, the main aspects is then interviewing people, writing uh, writing the policy paper and then also like we have uh, some uh, kind of gatherings where then our body of experts meet and these um, uh, these meetings need to be prepared so for those we actually also do make uh, some slides and kind of put together for them the information of what we have pre prepared so far so they then give feedback um, on, mm -hmm. on our work and then there's usually several um, Iteration. So we write the first draft of the text, then we get mm -hmm. feedback, uh, we write an improved second part, uh, second version of the text, and one more, and then one final iteration. So there's mm -hmm. several loops, basically, that we go through for uh, writing the policy paper. So one question, because you mentioned you have to write in German, and you have to... So the thing is... What the research that you're looking into is also mostly written in English, or if it's mostly written in more in international uh, international research, right? Because the work that you're looking at before you address the people is usually more or less in the international vernacular for science. So, is is being able to 
you know speak and write in german like a like an advantage definitely if you want to work here in uh, in akatech or any science adjacent field or is th- is the ability to not or you know is is this language does it form like a barrier for some people because they're not able to write in this uh... so i mean for working at uh, uh, at akatech and i guess that also counts for uh the uh, other German National Science Academy, the Leopoldina, where also, I guess, the texts that they produce are mainly in mm-hmm. uh, in, in German. I think if uh, you don't have a German almost equivalent to a native speaker, it's, it's uh, very hard. But mm-hmm. then, I mean, in uh, policy consulting, there's always also the EU level or English-speaking mm-hmm. countries where basically there exists similar jobs to what I do. And there, of course, then you don't be a, need to be a, a German speaker. But for uh, the jobs at Akatech, since most of the work mm-hmm. is in German, or it def- I think all of the work is in German, and then sometimes we also translate it to English, if we think it's relevant for an international uh, audience. So I guess mm-hmm. there, um, yeah. yeah. All right. So um, my next question would be: So um, concerning, so you write these uh, reports, uh, right? Every half year, you mentioned. Um, yeah. And so I saw on your website that you have these projects as well. So are do you publish basically uh, these reports in form of these projects then on your website, so that everyone so can see them? That's uh, where the innovation dialogue is a little bit different from most of the other work uh, that Akatech does because mm-hmm. this is a confidential format, so the uh, policy papers uh, are not uh, not published. But then mm-hmm. there's many other projects at uh, Akatech that regularly also publishes their work and also aims to uh, not only advise uh, policymakers but also is geared towards uh, towards the public. So you're also in these meetings, I would assume, with the government then? Not personally, uh, when the uh, steering committee, so that group of 17 experts meets uh, with the chancellor and the ministers. Uh, so that's then without me taking part. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. But you are meeting the experts like uh, in advance to basically talk through or go through the report and so on? Yes, yes. So uh, for the experts and also members of the ministries, mm-hmm. we do meet. We also do meet ah, those, okay. those 17 uh, people that then talk to, to the mm-hmm. government. Uh, I mean, now, of course, uh, since uh, COVID-19, all of mm-hmm. our interviews mm-hmm. and also meetings are only uh, virtual. Uh, yeah. But before that, also when we did some of the expert interviews, we would uh, go to where the uh, we people are sometimes and only okay. part of them we do with over uh, over telephone mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. how was it working with the government so far then i mean usually when you think about the government it's like everyone's uh, slow and no one wants to do their work or so on uh, so <laughs> have you had this uh, impression as well uh, do, do you mean I, the bureaucratic I, process <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> i did not have the uh, the impression that people don't want to do their work uh, i was actually yeah maybe surprised mm-hmm. is the wrong word but uh, <laughs> There's, there's um, very, very many very smart people working in government. Nonetheless, processes are sometimes slow. And I mean, the reasons for that are, are uh, manifold. It's on the one hand, of course, that they need to weigh interests from very many different groups. Um, and um, then also one aspect is uh, that, that I asked before I started working with the government underestimated is that Yes, I was aware that, of course, sometimes uh, politics in the form of there are members of different parties that have different interests play play a role. But also sometimes it's uh, the um, the collaboration between the different ministries, for example, could be a bit smoother. So uh, sometimes uh, things don't go as straight or as easy because also the the different interests or the different claims of the different ministries need to be oh, need to okay. be accommodated. So are you like uh, like the architect is like in between ministries um, and tries to mediate uh, to reach a common, um, I don't know, direction? Is there some projects that you propose which are cross-ministry uh, development or something which require more than one ministry to, or more than one department to sort of collaborate and do as well? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, I guess most uh, most um, projects involve more than than one ministry, and I guess that's that's from the very nature of uh, uh, of uh, Akatech, which is uh, of course uh, at the intersection of science and uh, and business to some extent. So it's more the mm -hmm. applied sciences, the engineering mm -hmm. sciences. So they and the way also that uh, Akatech sees itself. But I need to. Now, give the small caveat that I'm speaking now, of course, as a private person and not for architect. But the way mm -hmm. I see it is mm -hmm. that um, the job is not so much to mediate between ministries, but to somehow distill the view of, okay, the uh, academic world and the business world sees the things in these and these ways. These are the kind of facts that both uh, mm -hmm. the, the business world and academia agrees on. And mm -hmm. that then can form uh, the basis mm -hmm. basically of uh, of the government to to take decision to go maybe on a bit of a different uh, route so there's a lot of uh, phds in the max planck society that are actually not from germany so if everything is in german i would assume that it's a bit difficult for them to enter this kind of uh, career path here but uh, you mentioned that there, it, this uh, kind of job also exists on the eu level so where english would be i guess the uh, The preferred language. So, uh, where do you look for if you want to look for a job in this uh, field, or opportunities in these directions? Yeah. Um, for example, there's the um, from all the different uh, national science academies, they they form various uh, kind of unions on uh, mm -hmm. on the European level. There's uh, one that is called uh, Alea. I guess it's the Alliance of European Science Academies. Um, then there's, uh, they have also a system running science advice for policy by European ac academies. It's called SAPEA. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, something uh, similar of, uh, uh, on the European level. Um, then there's also uh, similar uh, organizations uh, that represent uh, the Universities, for example, there's one called LERU, the League of European Research mm -hmm. Universities, and they all do, to some or lesser extent, um, policy advice in one form or, mm -hmm. or another. Okay, great. So uh, just uh, information for the listeners. We would maybe, if uh, Jörg could uh, give us uh, the links uh, later, maybe uh, put together the notes and you would, should see them somewhere uh, on our website, I guess. Yes, or absolutely. in the show notes for this podcast episode. Oh, right. Yes. Um, great. Now, because to be honest, I have to admit, I never heard of this, of Akatech before. Uh, I mean, um, hearing from you, from the people in the lab. And yeah, I think it's a, a great uh, or a field that is um, being underestimated. I think there's, uh, as, especially as uh, scientists, you want to make sure that the science you do gets somewhat implemented or is useful somehow. Mm -hmm. So uh, finding this career path is like, uh, it's, it would be nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if people are interested at that intersection of uh, science and politics uh, on the European mm -hmm. level, There's also one opportunity that might be interesting, which is the, the JRC, the Joint Research Center uh, of, uh, of the European Union. And there basically both jobs exist. So they employ actual scientists that do research, but they also okay. have people then that also try to translate this uh, actual research into, into policy recommendations. And of course, if uh, you don't see yourself in the role of just giving advice but in actually doing things then mm -hmm. um, there's for the the entry level at the european uh, european authorities uh, uh, you can apply also with the science background okay yeah. uh, uh, moving on along in the same direction comp in comparison to europe germany is always one of those countries which is like pretty much on the top among a lot of European countries in terms of various aspects. In terms of uh, science and innovation, what do you think, where do you think Germany stands? It, it, it can be your personal opinion. It doesn't have to be the group opinion. Yeah, yeah, definitely now that uh, we go in the territory of what's just my, my, uh, my personal point of view. So how, you, how I see Germany's position in, 
in science and innovation in international comparison. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, Germany uh, is still, uh, still a very strong nation in science and innovation. Uh, but the, the, the strengths are definitely mostly or uh, uh, especially in the, in the basic sciences. I think that, uh, that's mm-hmm. where, where Germany and also on extension uh, Europe as a whole is uh, particularly strong. Uh, what is a bit more difficult is then translating findings from uh, uh, basic research into actual commercial application. This whole whole transfer of uh, of knowledge uh, process is, is probably working better in some other uh, uh, countries, and there's like a mm-hmm. whole host of reasons that you could put in. But um, in, in in general, the the strong basis in uh, in basic sciences should uh, still put, put Germany and also Europe as a whole in a very very good and strong position. Okay, yeah, no, it's just uh, because you hear, like, for example, that Germany has like a pretty bad internet compared to uh, the leader in Europe, which is Romania, and now there was like this whole debate about the five G implementation and also the kind of failed. Um, the failed constructions with the Berlin airport and Stuttgart 21. There is, there's like a lot of like bad things that you hear about Germany. And that's why, I don't know, my, my own uh, belief in Germany as being a leader in these things is, is got a bit demolished, I have to admit. Uh, I guess when it comes to the, the digital infrastructure, then definitely Germany is not in a, in a strong position. And also the, the position is... Uh, not the one that you would expect of a country that uh, does so well in many other uh, uh, metrics exactly. of, of, uh, that you can use for ranking science and, and innovation. And I think that's, uh, that's no secret. And uh, um, that's also that uh, basically whichever uh, advisory body that uh, talks to the government uh, will keep banging on on that point that if we want to con- compete in in the future where more and more of jobs and value creation will depend on uh, on on the digital world then also germany does need a much better digital infrastructure so um do you think that germany is following this lead uh, that uh, of like trying to implement them or are they just still going to lag behind uh um, now, so I mean, especially I mean, in, I guess in your position, you have a bit of an inside view of like if people actually or the pol- politicians actually do what uh, you recommend. Uh, I, I haven't worked really in in that specific area yet, so mm-hmm. my my insight is not not that deep. So it's basically just what you can gather from uh, from reading the newspapers and so on. So <laughs> I don't think. The problem is a lack of awareness, I guess. If you ask any member of government, they will all tell you that, yes, it's very important to improve our uh, digital mm-hmm. infrastructure. I guess the, the problem is that, on the one hand, it's, um, it's uh, different levels of administration. So you have local communities, okay. you have the states, mm-hmm. then you have the federal government. And to mm-hmm. get all of them to work uh, together efficiently is uh, complicated. And then also the the other aspect is to to some extent that um, for uh, for the companies to build the infrastructure, there also there needs to be the the positive business case. And apparently they don't see it, or they hope that uh, the government will uh, will uh, put even more money in so that it becomes more lucrative. I guess that's that's what mm-hmm. I can guess, but that's just. Mm-hmm. Uh, from reading newspapers and not from from uh, basis okay. on really like deep insight. For example, one thing that is like I mean I guess more of a pressing issue is like the the climate change. And for example, what I recently heard was that um, there's uh, um, there's uh, basically we have to pay some compensation for some power plants uh, that would have run out anyway soon. And now I wanted to ask if, like, there's, like, if you know of any uh, so projects to basically um, accelerate the change to more renewable energies and so on. Yes, there's um, uh, one large project group actually at uh, Akatech that's that's working on exactly these questions. It's called 
Energiesysteme der Zukunft, so Energy Systems of the Future. And I think they have been active now for several years and uh, writing reports on to how, uh, how to also build up the necessary uh, infrastructure then to smartly distribute uh, the energy again from renewable industries. Also, what role, for example, hydrogen can play as um, uh, um, a storage um, uh, molecule, more or less, or storage, uh, storage form of, of energy and how uh, hydrogen can be used to defossilize also industrial processes. So, um, Akatech is very active in that, and I think there's, there's many groups giving advice to to the government, but also again in this this question of uh, now the the exit from uh, coal power, there's there's always uh, several interests that the government needs to take into account. So on the one hand, of course, there's the pressing issue of climate change. Then, of course, you have the the interests of the uh, people living in the area that still rely on uh, um, getting coal out of the ground. Uh, so you need to provide them so, some sort of perspective. And um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in the role of an advisor and not in the role of the one having to take the actual decisions because sometimes you might feel they are uh, easy and straightforward, but uh, I guess often they are not. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so this kind of answers my next question. Uh, what I, I wanted to ask, uh, whether if you wanted to, uh, or if you want, would like to go into politics, because uh, you mentioned uh, something in this direction before. So I guess this is a no. Um, I wouldn't categorically rule it out. Um, I just uh, appreciate that it is a very challenging role to be in. But that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that I personally would share, uh, shy away from the challenge. But uh, I do see that uh, as someone in an advisory role, you have the easier job. Okay. So actually, one, yeah, one more thing that uh, I've been uh, meaning to ask is also about AI. So I mean, I, I saw in your uh, in the project page that you have a lot about AI, mm-hmm. uh, and I was because AI is this. I mean, I feel like it's being oversold a lot. Um, as I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in AI uh, by any means, but I feel like uh, yeah, it's like everywhere just tries to implement AI, and then that's a new innovation. So, uh, what uh, what exactly is, or do you know how Akatec is um, trying to implement it in like uh, new roles? So, um, I'm also not an expert on AI, mm-hmm. uh, but the the group uh, that's working uh, on AI at Akatec, they are called uh, Platform Learn the Learn the System, so Platform okay. for Learning Systems. And they basically, uh, that's a very uh, big project that has lots of partners, both from academia again and from the business side. Mm-hmm. And they have several sub-projects where they look either at specific use cases. So how can learning systems be implemented in uh, different economic sectors? Or how can learning systems, uh, for example, be used to uh, make uh, to, to work in... Um, Uh, in dangerous areas, so that goes more in the field of of combining uh, AI and robotics. Um, They also have uh, done quite a bit of work on what uh, AI can do in the field of healthcare, especially Mm -hmm. relevant now also, I guess, with with the ongoing COVID crisis. They Mm -hmm. have a special offering where they look at how AI can also help small and medium-sized enterprises But I also do see your point of that basically everything now gets the label AI, as in, for example, also in the future, probably everything will get slapped on with the label quantum. And that doesn't yes. necessarily <laughs> make things in itself better. And you need to always be yeah. a bit careful with these, these, uh, these hype terms. But then at the same time, I do see that there's, there's, there's huge potential in, in in applying mm-hmm. AI and in, in across a various field of technologies and businesses. Okay. Yeah, actually, and I remember one, I wanted to ask you about the topic we talked about before, like uh, hydrogen as a energy storage. So, I mean, the because the German government now actually just rolled out its plan of using it uh, mm-hmm. a lot. So were you guys also involved in that? Uh, or did you think that you're... Um, the projects you had or reports were helping in making this decision? 
Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, in the end, you also need to know that there's always several advisory bodies in different forms and shapes, and they all contribute. So it's very rarely that the government will just take like one report and say like, okay, these are the good ideas and we're going to implement them now one to one. That's usually not how the process works. But for sure, mm -hmm. uh, also also from the feedback that uh, that uh, the involved project that Akatec gets from the ministries, definitely some of the points have been been uh, taken mm -hmm. into account. So uh, yeah, I think that's that's one of the examples that that you then can see. Okay, that also our work does have some impact, even if suggestions are not uh, completely uh, taken over one to one into the government policy, but in general the um, uh, the direction is is the same as as, as was suggested. As an add-on to what uh, Nico said, so uh, because most of the policies that the government adopts takes a bit of time, and the suggestions that you make are actually uh, like right now or more more recent. So, do you have a bit of future proofing in mind when you actually make these reports and think a little bit about where the country should be in the future? When let let's say this whatever we suggest gets implemented, or is there is there a little bit of like sort of foresight involved in the work that you do uh, in order to sort of give suggestions to the government? Yeah, so um, I mean, kind of foresight is is definitely part of of the the daily business. Like that's also part of always what we try to achieve with reports is to not only give uh, the picture of okay, this is the situation right now but also what are the potential upcoming future challenges and opportunities and how the government should address them. What, of course, one can't do is like put a number on how much the lag time is from handing in Definitely. a report until something happens. Sometimes it's, it's surprisingly quick, and other times it's like two years later you see, ah, yeah, this were things that have been suggested already. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, the, the mysteries of the political process can, can work in both directions. Do you see like maybe if there's a difference depending on if there's like a election year or not, that people suddenly start to uh, follow the um, suggestions more? Um, I haven't personally been involved be, uh, I, I only joined after the last election okay. so I haven't uh, uh, lived it myself but I guess what I can imagine is that towards the end of the legislative period then things get a lot less busy because mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the politicians are very busy in uh, running a campaign and not so much on doing the day-to-day -day governing uh, anymore that takes a bit of a backseat but then uh, immediately after elections is always, I guess, a, a good point to, uh, to put forward new proposals because that's mm -hmm. when the, the government program is decided. And then, of course, that's a very, very high time of activity when everyone wants to get their uh, exciting topic somehow uh, recognized in the government program. Uh, actually, going back to Akatek itself, so what is the work um, work environment like there? Um, so, I mean, most people there are scientists by training usually, or do you also have people that just uh, start there from um, from the beginning? So, um, I guess the the majority has uh, usually a, um, a social sciences uh, background sometimes even humanities. Um, nationals, natural scientists and engineers are also present, but definitely not the majority. Um, so that's for the like scientific stuff that's in similar roles as, uh, as I am. These are usually people with um, at least a, a master's degree. A lot of people have PhDs, but, but definitely not all of them. Um, but then also, I mean, there's also some uh, jobs like uh, administrative assistance and so on. So also for uh, for people without um, a university degree uh, or uh, personal assistance, uh, then there's uh, staff that's uh, um, running the offices and so on. So, yeah. Okay. So w would you say that it's similar to working in the lab? Uh, I mean, aside from the uh, wet lab stuff, I guess. 
Um, to some extent, yes. Um, I mean, of course, as I said before, the big difference to definitely working uh, in the MPI is that it's uh, almost completely a uh, German uh, work environment. At least the, the working language definitely is German. Not everyone is German, but at least the, the everyday working language is uh, um, is German. Uh, it's similar in that we work in rather small teams. Um, usually also they are uh, fixed for uh, at least uh, the, the project duration. So it's not that we change around who we work with all the time, like it is uh, often in, in consulting. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, similar. And yeah, you have your, your desk and a computer. So I guess that's also uh, also quite similar. Um, you guys have like fixed working hours. It's uh, that you don't, I mean, or you can have like a time where you have to be in the lab or in the, sorry, in the office. Um, surprisingly, I often call it lab still uh, myself. <laughs> <Really? laughs> uh, so I still sometimes say to my, to my girlfriend, yeah, I need to go to the lab. And then she just mm -hmm. looks at me weirdly. And then <laughs> I go to the office. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, Yes, there are, uh, I mean, we in our team, I guess every team handles it a bit differently. We don't really have any fixed times where we need to be working. Um, but I guess usually people will expect that they can reach you from like nine to four or so. That like the, that's usually when people expect to, to uh, be reachable. Um, if I would, for example, only start much later uh, or leave earlier, then I would usually let my colleagues know that my, my times are not there. But it's not that there's a written down a specific time when we really need uh, to be present. Um, apart from that, we have a normal uh, contract uh, with uh, uh, like a federal employee. Um, so... Uh, so not a Beamter for those speaking German, but just uh, Angestellter im öffentlichen Dienst, just very similar to what actually you are at, uh, at the Max Planck Institute. Um, uh, so we work 39 hours per week. And if we do overtime, we write down the hours and at some point we uh, can take them off again. And that actually works. So... Um, Sometimes there are times, especially just before finishing the reports, usually then the hours become a bit longer and 39 hours will not be uh, enough in a week. But then uh, on times when there's uh, a, bit, a bit less work to do, then uh, we can also take the time off again. So the people are still motivated to get their reports done uh, because, I mean, it can have an impact on, on policies, right? Yes, I mean, that's definitely the, the uh, deadlines we have. They are super strict. So when there's that uh, uh, meeting of this, uh, this group of experts with the government, then we need to have the report ready so and so many weeks before. And there's not no, no way of moving it around. So we are on, on very, very determined, strict uh, schedules. Okay, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, the the pol politicians have like a tight schedule and this meeting is like, yeah. I guess, planned so much, quite long ahead of time already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's also, I mean, for, for a report, you also need to figure in the time that it takes to print it, the time that um, uh, the graphic design company takes to actually produce uh, the nice looking version of the report that then is printed. And uh, so that's all time that you don't really have for writing anymore. So I mean, you need to figure these things in, in your in your project plan. Okay. So maybe as a final question, uh, do you like your job? Yes, absolutely. No, um, it's uh, I, I like it a lot. It's uh, very exciting. I get uh, I have uh, very lovely colleagues. I get to work at exciting topics that also change every uh, half a year. I get to talk to top experts in, in the field. And uh, yeah, sometimes I guess also the work that I and the team in a, as a whole does uh, can have some impact on, on actual government work. So yeah, I think all in all, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Also, as a, another quick closing question, would you have any words of wisdom for people willing to follow like this sort of path in their like post-academic careers? 
works of wisdom for people that are that are looking for a similar path to me. Yeah. Um, keep uh, looking and keep uh, pushing on doors until one will open. <laughs> and uh, if you're really interested in, in what I do also, you can uh, find me on uh, LinkedIn and just message me and maybe I can give you some more specific advice. Okay. So we can probably put your contact details in the show notes as well. Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot for joining us. and It was a pleasure talking to you. Great. Thank you. It was lots of fun. And uh, good luck with your remaining PhDs. You're still both PhD students, right? Yes, yeah. definitely. And yeah. then also with the choice of what comes after. <laughs> Thanks. I have no so clue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should be finishing within the next two years, but I have absolutely Things no clue will, what to do. Uh, someone at some point somehow fall into place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, we all hope for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. This was uh, really, really nice to talk. Thanks. So, Nico, what do you think of the interview? Yeah, I think it was great to get like a different uh, career um, option or information about one, uh, especially one that I think is not so talked about uh, as frequently as others, like consulting or biotech. Uh, how did you like or it? Or even the merging between politics, because I find that to be very fascinating, because as, we, as we've all had our sort of, uh, like our visions about what politics and how politics works... And being in, a, being in science, we always have this belief that politicians and politics usually tend to ignore sound science. But now we do see that there are companies which are trying to put forth ideologies in a very systematic and regular way so that everyone can understand and these can indeed turn into new policies for a country's functioning. And I think this is... And also we, when, when we could hear that in the European level this is possible, and I think that's something which a lot of people should keep in mind and sort of if they're interested in these fields this would be a good starting point for them at least if they want to advance their political careers as well as their scientific yeah no i completely agree i mean no, i find it uh, good that the that the government is paying for these um for these independent kind of uh, institutions that um try to give them or consult them on like the uh, emerging topics or new innovations which is uh, very important so uh, i find it as you mentioned like with on with the eu level it's not just a thing that german speaking people can do right and i exactly. think also uh, if you go to their website of akatec you can see that there's international collaborators as well so it's actually a worldwide thing and i would assume he also mentioned in the interview that it's actually not just them uh, giving advice to the government but rather several Several institutes or exactly. agencies so I could imagine that there's actually more out there than one might think and also it's it's up to everyone who's interested in these topics to find out that these things actually exist and the various opportunities that are available in these directions which I think we're not made completely aware of during our work in our labs at all and I'm sure I'm sure this podcast is going to be one of those methods in which people at least get to know about these opportunities, if not actively pursue it. Well, I hope so, of course, that uh, the people listening to this will uh, take something from it. Um, no, and I mean, not as we're both kind of... Um, more active in the phd net as well i think you kind of uh, start to um, see what politics actually is and as he mentioned i think being in this advisory position is a lot nicer than having to decide because the responsibility of um of to for all these people like as you mentioned for example the, the workers that uh, uh, were, uh, that uh, have to dig up the coal and so on the like trying to um, find something for them is I bet not easy and so yeah definitely it's gonna be interesting I mean also the challenges that it offers to people and the challenges that it provides on a day-to-day -day basis as well as the way of working with strict deadlines helps you really develop a very good time management and time allocation and planning skills, which I think we get, we, we learn a lot of this very well in our PhDs, but you know, you really need to develop these to an extent where it's more 
more and more strict. And I think this is this is something which we can really have a, as a takeaway from this interview that we had with Jörg. And uh, I think with that, we've uh, come to the conclusion of a very, very interesting episode of Offspring Podcast. And uh, we're going to definitely have another interesting guest on the next one. So I would request everyone to stay tuned and we'll be right back even before you know it. Bye. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the science communication working group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar and the pre-intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrito. The podcast series is hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Herman and Alison Lewis. And we have two new members who will be joining us from next year in Adrian La Hoya and Sandra Fendel. If you have any feedback, comments or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Looking forward to hearing from you and we will see you all promptly next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Please practice safe social distancing and see you all next week. Bye.